joining us on the phone is Cities CEO Mike Corbett. Michael, always great to talk to you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me this morning. Uh, will you take the pledge, sir? You take the pledge to uh, not uh, have any layoffs? Because I would normally think that given the fact that things are tougher, city would, the old city, would lay off people right now. Well, Jim, we, we instituted our own pledge a while back that we haven't been laying people off. And we actually announced a few weeks ago that about 75,000 of my colleagues would be receiving a check, helping them with the challenging times right now. We've given anyone who needs it in our company paid time off, sick, or challenged family situations. We've expanded benefits, and uh, we've obviously been expanding the utilization of our foundation in the community. So um, we're, we're pledge plus at this time. Okay, there are a lot of people, particularly seniors, who rely on dividends for income. You currently have a yield of 5.1 percent. Uh, yesterday, the European banks suspended their dividends. Uh, do you have any plans to do that, or can we count on the dividend? Because I know that we had to not count on the buyback anymore. Yeah, you know, we, uh, a group of us, the eight large banks in the U.S., made the decision a few weeks ago that we would be suspending buybacks. And if you look at in the in the U.S. banking system, in particular amongst the largest bank buybacks, constitute the, the majority, in our case, vast majority of the capital return to our shareholders. We did that to, to be in sync with the challenge of the crisis that, that's going on and to, to make sure that all of us coming in in strong capital and liquidity positions could maintain that stance. And uh, I think there's some structural and nuances, Jim, between the U.S. and Europe that are a bit different. One is that the European banks pay an annual dividend, and so there's a window in which to declare. We, put, we pay quarterly uh, dividends. If you look at the capital levels, if you look at the earnings of the U.S. banks, uh, I think they come into this in a bit of a different uh, – from a different position, a position probably of some more strength. So, um, you know, uh, from our perspective, our dividend is sound, and we plan on continuing to pay it. Michael, I, I keep reading these articles. Uh, for day, today's The New York Times. Outbreak sets off stampede by companies to tap credit. I read that the companies that are involved in the mortgage market are, are, are asking for forbearance. I actually read a piece this morning saying that these, these combinations, the revolvers, the mortgage market, could be worse than 2007 to 2009. I'm, I know, and you know me outside of work, occasionally given to hyperbole. But is that hyperbole? And is it something that we should be more worried about than we are, which is this colossal edifice coming down because of forbearance? Well, I, I think, you know, one is that, you know, to, to really set the table here, Jim, this really is a, a public health crisis that has manifested itself into a economic crisis. And I've heard you talk about it a number of times, but testing and vaccines are, are core to getting us back on track. And um, certainly from a U.S. perspective and from a broader global perspective, the worst thing that we can have is uncertainty. But I have to say in these times, people, uh, people have been rising to the challenge and uh, the acts of kindness and uh, acts of giving that I've seen have truly been extraordinary. And there's no doubt in my mind, uh, like other things before, we're going to get through this. And I think it's up to the system to, to try and chart that way. She had Secretary Mnuchin on, and I would start out by saying that the actions of our government, of the administration, of the Treasury, of the Federal Reserve have just been extraordinary. And as banks, our role is to, is to – or our roles are to do a couple things. One is to make sure that we're here supporting our customers and clients, which we're doing. And as you talk about credit, the, the Bank Policy Institute put out a piece last night saying that um, banks in the U.S. lent about $400 billion in the first quarter of the year. Citi was over $50 billion of that in terms of supporting uh, our clients. Sure, we've seen – uh, revolver draws, uh, but it hasn't been um, necessarily outsized. And we've seen the bond markets functioning pretty well. Right? We had a record month of $260 billion of issuance in investment grade. We've seen some high yield issues get done. Uh, and I think companies right now view this and the uncertainty as a place where it's prudent to build liquidity. And so uh, the programs that we've put in place, the programs that the government has put in place uh, and other banks have, uh, are, are there to do that. Uh, let me ask you, Mike. Mr. Uh, Cor Mr. Oh, Corbett. Go ahead, David. Oh, thank ahead, you, David. Jim. Uh, Mr. Corbett, it's David Faber. You know, on this subject of capital adequacy and liquidity, 
Can you give us a sense as to what your modeling looks like, given the revolvers that are being pulled down? Now, you just mentioned $50 billion in the first quarter in terms of new lending. But we know that there are going to be some bankruptcies. We know that there are going to be people unable, be people unable to pay things like their credit cards. Um, what do your models look like and tell you in terms of your capital adequacy, in terms of your reserve cushion? You seem to be painting a positive picture. Is that the way you feel right now, given all the unknowns that are yet to come? Well, as you say, David, there, there are a lot of unknowns, um, but you've seen over the last several years the stress testing that's gone on in the system and the severity of the scenarios that the banks are run and held to in terms of capital and liquidity, liquidity adequacy. And I think we, we, we feel like we're coming into this from a position of strength. Clearly, the system is going to be challenged. That, um, uh, as your own people say, as our people say, we're going to see spikes in unemployment. And I think the responsibility of the system is to try and turn that those spikes as quickly as possible. And uh, going back to Secretary Mnuchin's comments, I think the CARES Act, this $350 billion that we need to get ASAP into small business hands is critical. Uh, as part of that. And uh, I think from, from our perspective, you know, we're here, we're open, we're lending, um, and uh, we're also making sure that our customers and clients have the ability to take advantage of these government programs. I think an important nuance that we've got to be mindful of here, though, is that uh, there's liquidity and there's the extension of credit, and both things have to be operating properly. And I think a lot of what we've seen is is uh, is the government and uh, and uh, our regulators responding to to liquidity. And I think the second leg of this is we all have to be um, focused on making sure that we can get credit into the into the right hands to make sure these businesses and people have a chance. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Corbett. But Chapel Trust has owned City for ages. It was a huge winner. Obviously, now it's down like all the bank stocks. Uh, tangible book value, seventy dollars, completely scrubbed. Probably the cleanest of all. Stock at thirty nine. Can't buy back stock, which unfortunately I think might be a great buy. But does this signal something that we don't know? Does the does the decline in stock signal that the non performers are going to spike? Does it signal that the book value no longer has the relevance that it used to? Because the disconnect, as you know, is palpable. Listen, as I said, we, we go into this from a, a position of sound capital and liquidity and balance sheet. Uh, and, and as you say, it's, it's been scrubbed. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainties out there and uh, around rising unemployment, around business challenges. I think people look and they, they say, and it's not necessarily city specific, but they say, you know, the banks are, are, are there. They're, they have exposure to the businesses. They have exposure to the people. And we don't know where this is going to go, kind of going back to my point of, of uncertainty. But again, I, I think the banks come into this from a position of strength, and I think we've got a very important role to play here, not just in terms of our day-to-day -day jobs of supporting our customers and clients, which we do, but being that sound intermediary between fiscal and monetary and the real economy and making sure that all these extraordinary actions, not just here in the U.S., but around the world, can be brought to bear and brought to life uh, for our economies and, and the people in them. Hey, Michael, it's Carl. Um, your point about liquidity and extension of credit in the short term is obviously the most important thing. But once caseload in this country returns to a so-called manageable level, how does small business lending and consumer lending structurally change? What would you say to small business owners who are worried about getting a loan a year from now, having taken on debt and, and lived through uh, the episode that we're in? Well, I think one, you know, to Secretary Mnuchin's point that um, provided this money is used around what's outlined, it, it actually won't be ballooning their debt. And um, we're all hoping through through testing, through social distancing and the other best practices that are going on that we could bend this curve relatively quickly. And, you know, in the in the CARES program, uh, you effectively get two and a half months of coverage. And, uh, you know, we're hoping that we can be able to bend this curve and to get these businesses back on their feet or keep them on their feet uh, to be able to come out the other side of this so that they're not uh, ballooned up with debt or having challenges in terms of debt service into the future. And then they can make their decisions in terms of how they want to invest in CapEx and grow their business. 
Mr. Corbett, it's David Faber again. You know, one thing that we hopefully look forward to, of course, is getting on the other side of this. And one of the key questions is how are behaviors going to change in a significant way? As the leader of a large organization with scores of employees, I assume, working from home, not to mention a lot of retail frontage in terms of your branches, how do you see city and, in general, the changes uh, that are taking place now affecting behavior in the future in terms of your workforce, uh, both uh, on trading desks or bankers and the people in the branches? Well, uh, we all went into this with lots of contingency plans. Uh, I, I don't think many or any of us really imagined the day where we would have the vast majority of our people working from home. Um, as of today, we've got over 160,000 of our 200,000 employees working from home um, at various percentages around the world, but roughly 80% uh, of our people. And we didn't imagine that. And um, I think a couple things really come out of this is one is that uh, one is we can do it, that we stood this up very quickly. And I think we were fortunate, if you would call it that, in terms of uh, having been in this public health crisis in Asia early on and see it coming west and had the ability to experiment and try different things uh, so that as it came here, uh, we were we were as prepared as, as we could be. Um, I think it, it, um, it changes things from a, a social aspect in terms of, of potentially how people interact and um, what meetings or other things are like, maybe in particular at certain times of the year, and maybe some of your more contagious se seasons. Uh, I think it changes the way that businesses and people contingency plan. You know, as an example, uh, just from a human aspect, as I, I grew up in a family with two Depression era, World War II parents, and our pantry was always stocked. And maybe going forward, the pantry is just going to be a lot fuller in a number of homes around the world as people think about things differently. Michael, you remember those, Jesus, canned peaches, canned pears from Del Monte? Weren't they terrible? We didn't know, though, at the time that food cocktail wasn't so bad. <laughs> hey, let, 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 me, let me ask you something. Uh, we had the Treasury <laughs> Secretary on. And he's talking about this great page that he created where on Friday we can uh, apply for loans. And we talk about bankers. So how does it work? Let's say Citi's my banker. And I, 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 I have a dry cleaner. And it's pretty consistent. Remember, I don't have any inventory with Track Cleaner. That's why it's such a good business. Uh, do I uh, go to my branch? Do I call? What do I do to be sure that I get my money? Well, one is we instituted several weeks back for small business um, basically available anytime support nights, weekends for our small businesses. And I think one thing that's critical in terms of the implementation of what's gotten to be known as the Payroll Protection Act is that we've got the ability to do it digitally. Right? We don't want to have people having to come out. So making sure that we've got the digital interface set up so that people can apply online, we can get the documentation that we need online for the vast majority of these loans, and that we can turn this money and get it into small business hands as quickly as we can. So from our perspective, we are working around the clock to make sure that our portal is set up and that uh, not just our business, but any business that wants to come to us uh, for help and for access to the program that we're up and running to be able to do that. Michael, you're a family guy. I know your wife, know your kids. Uh, what's it like when you get up in the morning? You, do you think about, like, the mall that might close? Do you think about the loans that, that, are, that are in trouble? Do you think about, uh, about COVID and your family and what do you do uh, about the way? Are you separated from your family? What, what's life like for a big banker right now in an era that we've never seen before? So uh, I'm fortunate that um, I'm, I'm with my wife. I am with my son and my daughter-in-law. My, my daughter and her husband live abroad, and, and they're fine and, and being um, sheltered in place with, with uh, her husband's family. Um, World, World Headquarters is set up in something that's a little bit bigger than a closet. Um, initially, we had a skirmish to, to, to get <laughs> Wi-Fi and, and bandwidth uh, sufficient to support all of us. But, you know, the day starts um, clearly with the family, but um, it's thinking about our people, our 200,000 people, and how do we keep them out of harm's way? 
how do we do everything we can to support our customers and clients, and what are the things that we can be doing uh, to be able to do that, and obviously trying to make sure that we're, in the long run, making the right decisions for our shareholders in terms of how we run the bank and making sure that we're supporting the communities that we're that we're in and um, you know kind of knowing that those communities need to to be there and to be healthy in order for us to to um, to be healthy so I think it's really in the round and it goes back to I think what you were talking about before in terms of finding the right balance between uh, between all your different constituencies and I, I got to say from a city perspective my colleagues have been incredible in terms of um, the resilience and uh, people doing just extraordinary things to, to help other people, to help our customers and clients. And, and again, I think, you know, we're, we're seeing just great examples of human nature and, and really who we are. And uh, I'm very encouraged by that. Michael, your, uh, your point about your family members and the depression area family members is, is so vivid. I wonder, you know, in the early days when we really got a sense of how serious this was going to be uh, just a month or two ago, uh, there were anecdotal stories about bank branches running out of $100 bills, uh, demand for cash. Can you got any color around that? And what's happened with deposits lately? Well, um, Carl, I would say, you know, we've we've tried to strike the right balance. We've tried to make sure that there's um, money in our ATMs constantly. We want to make sure that our, our ATM screens are getting uh, cleaned and disinfected constantly. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, our, our branches are open. We may not have every branch open, but we've got our branch employees at work. And at the same time, we want to make sure that they're safe, that there's enough distance between them and the people that they're serving such that we don't put them in harm's way. And so we have operated really uninterrupted through this. Uh, and again, we've really been trying to, to also drive people remotely and to make sure they take advantage of all the digital things that are out there. So re remote uh, check deposit, their ability, we've up limits in terms of the usage of Zelle and the way people can transfer money. And of course, um, you know, we're, we're always open to make sure that people have access to their cash when they want it. Uh, Mr. Corbett, David Faber again. Earlier you had said, I think in answer to one of my questions, that the system, meaning the financial system, is going to be challenged. I wonder, what are you watching closely, whether it's an increase uh, in infections or something in the financial markets, to try to determine when that challenge is going to peak and when we're going to sort of be on the other side of it? You know, I think one of the lessons here, David, is that, you know, in, in this, and I think it's a, an important lesson for life, that, um, that y you can't go to where this is. When we look at the virus, if we simply judged where we are today, by nature, we're behind it. And I think what we've tried to do is really look and try and get, get to this or get ahead of it. And I think the the expectations being put out there around that it's likely in the U.S. to get worse before it gets better. Um, I would say another important thing is that, you know, not everything is, is equal in this, meaning that from a, a geography perspective uh, around the world, the cure rate or the, uh, the, um, the recidivism of this um, will be at different pace based on, on social practices, on, on many testing or other things. And we've got to understand that's going to be the case in the United States, that maybe New York is going to be at the front end of this in terms of peaking and hopefully rolling over. But we're going to have to take a more nationalist approach. Uh, and so clearly we're, we're watching the virus. We're watching the pace of acceleration, deceleration. And the good news is we're seeing some early signs of some deceleration. And hopefully as this roll, rolls over, it rolls over quickly. But I think we've got to be mindful. And again, we've seen it in places like Asia and had uh, calls with my colleagues this morning that we're seeing some importing where cases are starting to go back up as people are starting to come back home or to move again. And I think we've got to be mindful of that. I think from a, from an economic perspective, employment's clearly going to be uh, a big thing that we're going to watch. And, and uh, again, I just think some of the vulnerabilities of the U.S. economy around uh, some of the, the challenge sectors. And I saw a statistic in one of our reports right now that said 75% of the people and 90% of the GDP 
in the United States right now is either at stay at home or social distancing. And, and so to me, it comes down to how quickly can we turn this? Um, how quickly can we get testing and get uncertainty out? Uh, and how quickly can we get people back to work and, uh, and back to living normal lives uh, as part of this? And those are, those are the things that we're obviously watching very closely. All right, uh, Michael, uh, very important to point out the City Foundation committed to provide $15 million to support COVID-19 related relief activities globally. Uh, people can find out from your website, I'm sure, how it's being allocated. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show, Michael, and for giving us the much-needed perspective and optimistic perspective that you always share. Great to talk to you, sir. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Stay healthy, guys.